um, with that, I would like to introduce uh, Professor John Mayer. He is a professor in the Department of Politics at Cal Poly Humboldt in Northern California. He serves in an interdisciplinary program on environmental studies and environment and community. As a political theorist, his work aims to help us understand how our social and political values and institution shape our relationship with the environment how these values and institutions are shaped by this relationship and how we might use an understanding of both to pursue a more socially just and sustainable society. Some of his current work explores the intersection between climate politics and the political potentials and dangers of populism. He is the author of seven books and among them is the award-winning Engaging the Everyday, Environmental Social Criticism and the Resonance Dilemma, which came out in 2015 with MIT. He is also an editor of the Oxford Handbook on, on Environmental Political Theory, and he's also an editor-in-chief of the International Journal Environmental Politics. Hi. Hi, Professor Mayer. How are you today? I'm, I'm well, thank you. Uh, and thanks to, to all who have joined. I, I uh, have a sense that this is probably uh, the, the tiring end of a long week for you all on a, a Friday afternoon for, for many of you, first thing in the morning for me. But uh, um, in any case, um, thank you all for, for joining us today. And um, I, I hope to at least provoke a, maybe a different perspective on uh, populism and uh, climate politics. And so I'll just go ahead and, and share my screen and, and uh, share my, my talk and then uh, look forward to your questions and, and comments after that. Um, so let's start by sharing the screen. Uh, okay. I trust everybody can see that now. Okay, great. Um, all right, and let me just get this set up. Okay. Um, so uh, my title, as as you see here, is the ambiguous promise of climate populism. Uh, my my goal here is to think broadly about what frames uh, around populism, rhetoric around populism, what the populism genre might offer us uh, as a, a frame for thinking about uh, the challenges and also maybe the opportunities of uh, climate politics today. Um, so that's that's really the, the, the focus of uh, what I'll be doing here for uh, the next uh, 40 minutes or so. And uh, while I'm Thinking of it, I'll set my timer so that I can remember uh, when my time is up. Um, okay, um, so uh, the ambiguous promise of climate uh, populism. I, I just want to kind of outline here uh, the four main themes that I'll spend my time focusing on. The first of them, and perhaps the most familiar for all of you, is uh, an account of uh, what's often called right wing or authoritarian populism and its relationship to climate change and climate change politics. And, and I'll summarize that relatively briefly, since, as I say, I think it may be most uh, familiar to all of you. Um, secondly, I want to talk about a, a particular kind of reaction to that authoritarian populism in relation to climate. Um, I'm uh, labeling it here following scholars like Benjamin Moffat and uh, others as anti-populism. And as I say here, um, I'm going to make a case uh, that uh, we should understand anti-populism as a sort of trap, um, and I'll try and unpack and explain what that means. All this, of course, invites us to think about what the definition of populism itself is, and I'm fully aware, and I'm sure by this point in the week, all of you are as well, uh, that um, there are many, many different definitions and ways of conceptualizing what populism is. Um, the, the, the frame that I'm using that I think is, is particularly productive and useful is one that was distilled by uh, Jane Mansbridge and Stephen Macedo in an article that I'll mention a bit more about later um, titled uh, Populism and Democratic Theory. What they do there is, is distill and, and sift through <clears throat> excuse me, um, a, a great variety of literature on populism and debates about populism. 
and argue that um, in the end, what's distinctive about populism is this frame of, around pitting the people in moral battle against elites. So, so uh, three or four components there, the people, moral battle, and elites. Um, but that's uh, actually uh, that core definition as they understand it um, excludes from the core uh, many other characteristics, including a homogene homogeneous conception of the people and uh, excludes notions of the general will that, that many others import into their definition. So I'll say a little bit more about that um, as we go along. And then finally, um, I want to suggest one way, uh, a particular way of thinking about climate justice and climate justice movements, um, either, as I say here, as populism or maybe the more uh, uh, balanced way of, of offering this account is to say uh, that we'll talk about, I'll have something to say about climate justice movements through a populist frame. Um, and so those are the four main themes that I'm going to try and cover with all of you today. So, so let's just get into it. Um, so again, the first theme, authoritarian populism and climate change. And I wanted to just acknowledge at the outset that, that again, um, I'm going to get, provide a very quick overview of some material that I think is familiar. And that throughout this talk, although I want to offer some illustrations and examples, I'm going to primarily focus this on, on uh, some conceptual contrasts and comparisons between these, these different ways of thinking about the relation of populism and climate change. I'm sure many of you uh, can think of examples and illustrations that fit in these different categories. Um, of course, authoritarian populism is typically populated. The main actors that are, are typically pointed to in this context are right-wing political parties and leaders. Um, uh, and often the account given in this frame is of climate policy as a globalist and elite driven project uh, that is criticized by these right-wing parties and leaders in the interests of uh, a homogeneous notion of the people, right? Um, and that that's, uh, again, the, the, some, some sort of contrast between the elites and the people is, is I think integral to almost anybody's definition of populism and is why uh, these kinds of approaches to uh, critiquing climate change politics are often characterized in those terms. Um, one thing I would also note uh, about many uh, so-called authoritarian populists and populist parties and leaders in this frame is that they often differentiate between local or national environments on the one hand and global climate change um, and global uh, strategies and policies to address climate change on the other. That is, um, many, uh, Marine Le Pen in France, for example, but, but many other illustrations uh, around the globe uh, of right-wing leaders that will embrace and talk about uh, the value of protecting land and water, um, uh, about uh, protecting rural lifestyles. This is a familiar uh, refrain in, among uh, right-wing populists in the United States, um, uh, protecting rural livelihoods um, and landscapes. Um, so that argument is often integral to these, these uh, frames, uh, but the, the distance between that and global climate change is often vast. And that distinguishes, of course, many of these actors from those on other points in the political spectrum. Um, and finally, and again, I, I take this as probably familiar to many of you, um, the account of many of these authoritarian populists is that um, they are climate, uh, and this is a familiar term in the United States, but I think is uh, applied increasingly globally, um, that uh, they are climate denialists, that is, uh, that they deny the existence of climate change uh, or its significance. Um, the broader term that's come to be used in the literature rather than climate denialists is climate skeptics or climate skepticism. And the, the argument, it has often been made that, that by denying or being skeptical about climate change, they politicize the issue of climate change itself. So what I'm trying to do here and what I hope I, I've, I've done just in, in a few brief minutes is give you sort of some of the key characteristics of this reasonably familiar frame. We can think of many uh, examples globally 
Um, uh, certainly Donald Trump here in the United States has often been uh, cast in this framework um, and fits most of these characteristics. Uh, Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil, um, uh, Duterte in the Philippines, uh, I mentioned Marine Le Pen in France and so forth. Um, there's certainly more variation um, and variety than, than this uh, single slide and brief overview can, can provide. Um, but I think this gives you some sense of how authoritarian and right-wing populists have often approached the climate issue. Um, now, this last point that I, the last bullet on my slide here about climate denialism and climate skepticism, I think is worth unpacking a little further before we go on. So let me just draw here um, a little bit of a, an interlude before we go to the other uh, parts of my argument. Um, I want to draw here from an argument by uh, von Rensberg. You can see the citation here to his 2015 article on climate change skepticism. And what von Rensberg does is uh, tries to uh, unpack what it means to talk about somebody as a climate skeptic um, or uh, to engage in climate change skepticism. And I think what, what you can see here uh, on the uh, left side here, what he describes as the core or definitional arguments about climate skepticism is that they're skeptical about the evidence of climate change. Right. Um, so he, this is the center part of, of, of the thing that they're skeptical about the evidence of climate change. Um, they're skeptical about climate science, typically, um, and that can manifest. And I'm not going to spend too much time in the bottom part of this chart that can manifest as skepticism about the trends. That is, maybe it's uh, maybe the, the globe is warming right now, but maybe that's not a long term trend or, or some sort of uh, skepticism like that. They're skeptical about the causes. So here the, 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 the challenge or the questions or the denial is focused on uh, the, the, the notion of uh, climate change as anthropogenic, human caused, um, and they're skeptical about the impacts, right? Um, maybe the climate is warming, maybe things are being disrupted, but um, won't that also, the argument is sometimes made, um, uh, lead to uh, longer growing seasons uh, in northern latitudes and far southern latitudes and so forth. Maybe those are good things. Um, they're not universally bad. So this is familiar. When we talk about climate skeptics or climate denialists, denying the evidence that climate change is real uh, or is a, a cause for concern is certainly a familiar part of the argument. But as uh, von Rensberg notes, and, and we're going to focus a little bit more on this, there's a variety of other arguments that are often lumped into and, and often uh, are a part of arguments about climate skepticism that focus much more on process and on response than on scientific evidence itself, right? Um, and again, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but the, again, the, 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 uh, uh, a skepticism about the process might raise doubts about how scientific knowledge is generated in the first place or how uh, consensual or unified the, the scientific community is around climate change. Um, it might also, and I think this is especially important, call into question or be skeptical about decision-making processes through the uh, IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, or other national processes, how climate decision-making processes um, are pursued. And finally, it might focus on particular responses, and here we're thinking mainly of policy responses to climate change, calling into question particular policy instruments and particular styles of policymaking. So uh, again, this much more inclusive conception of climate skepticism, I think, um, allows us to think about these issues in somewhat different ways. And as we'll see in this, this category of process and response skepticism, um, uh, many climate justice activists and organizers also critique these processes and responses. Um, and I think that, that, that we can draw some significant conclusions from that. I'll, I'll come back to that. Okay. Um, I'm just going to move on. I was going to ask for any questions, but I think it's probably better just for me to move through this and then uh, turn to the questions when we're done. But please, please keep track. And if any of this is unclear or you want me to go back to it, I'm more than happy to do so. 
Okay, so the next frame, uh, as I noted at the beginning, is, is what I'm calling anti-populism. Anti-populism is typically uh, a framework that is uh, central, although it's often not labeled this, um, that is often central in many political systems to establishment parties and political leaders, also parties and leaders and, uh, and uh, spokespeople at the global level. Um, at the United Nations, at the UNFCCC, and so forth, the United Nations Framework Conventions on Climate Change. Um, it's a frame that's often found in uh, what is sometimes called legacy media or uh, long-term established uh, mass media outlets. Um, it's a framework that's often espoused by large-scale multinational NGOs. Um, and I think it's not unreasonable to characterize these as uh, uh, social, political, and economic elites who are expressing this anti-populist framework. So what is the framework? What is the argument in relation to climate politics? Well, first of all, I think it appeals to uh, what, uh, again, for lack of a better word, we might describe as a mainstream political imaginary or perhaps a nostalgic imaginary that argues that uh, we could address climate change much more effectively if uh, politics was more civil and less uh, divisive, if we were more respectful of pluralism um, and plurality of values and ideas, um, and perhaps most centrally in the climate debate, um, if we were respectful of and willing to follow the science um, and uh, in some ways, uh, this might be better put uh, with a capital S, the science, um, as something that we should, should follow. And I've, I've concluded this, trying to capture this mainstream political analogy with a, a quote uh, uh, from a couple of years back by the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, um, speaking uh, at, I believe it was at the opening of uh, one of the, the, the COP meetings, uh, the Conference of Parties of the UNFCCC. Um, appealing in fairly uh, tough and demanding language uh, for the need for the international community to address climate change. Um, but the central message that I think he tried to convey and that, that he repeated uh, was, we're all in this together, he says to the leaders around the globe, um, we need to work together um, to solve it. And, and I think that that captures something of a, a mainstream political uh, imaginary um, that, that uh, I think is useful for thinking about here. And finally, and uh, of course, this is most relevant to thinking about climate change, uh, the anti-populist frame uh, rejects skepticism in all the forms that I've characterized it to this point and rejects the politicization of climate change, again, arguing uh, that we should listen to the science and follow the science in terms of implementing policy. Again, uh, just the caveat, uh, that uh, uh, this is obviously a distillation, a, a sort of ideal type of this argument. Uh, and there's certainly many variations and not necessarily the case that everybody embraces all parts of this. Um, but I think that this does ca characterize uh, a distinctive and I think in many ways dominant uh, response to uh, authoritarian populism on climate. Okay, let me offer a few examples or just sort of brief illustrations of this uh, view of uh, anti-populism on climate. And I'll, I'll do it through a few different uh, news articles and media uh, blog posts and so forth. Um, the first one here uh, comes from the New York Times. Uh, I apologize in advance to those of you located in Europe for uh, using a, an American news source to illustrate a, a European political uh, situation. Uh, but I think that this article that was published at the opening of the, uh, the COP26 meeting in Glasgow about a year and a half ago uh, captures well some of these anti-populist elements. Uh, the headline here, Europe fears that rising cost of climate action is stirring anger. Of course, that's, that's not an unreasonable uh, concern. Um, and, and note here, uh, he, uh, the, the author, excuse me, uh, uh, the, or the headline writer at least, uh, argues that memories of the Yellow Vest movement, the, the so-called uh, Guillaume Jean in, in France, uh, is prompting officials to uh, basically worry about energy prices and that they don't fuel inequality or populist discontent. 
Um, and similarly, if we go on uh, uh, in, the, in the story, and this is just the beginning of it, uh, we see uh, the argument that uh, many world leaders view uh, one of the biggest risks involved in decarbonizing the planet is a populist backlash, right? Um, so uh, again, I just offer this as an illustration. And actually, I'm going to come back to the, 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 the yellow vest, the guillet jaune um, in France a little bit uh, later in my talk. Um, another uh, recent, a more recent example from uh, last uh, autumn, uh, for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, at least last autumn, uh, the populist climate threat. Uh, the, the authors of this piece, I think, are, are relevant here. Uh, Isabella uh, Teixeira is the former Brazilian environment minister. Uh, Ana Tony is uh, the executive director of a large uh, environmental and climate NGO in Brazil. And uh, Lawrence uh, Tubiana, uh, I believe is how you pronounce his name, uh, is the former French ambassador to the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And again, we get the same sort of message. Reactionary populism is now the biggest obstacle to tackling climate change. The tactics of today's populace are becoming an existential threat. Um, I, th I think it's worth just pausing here, and I'll, I'll offer up one more example in a minute. Um, to note that in order for these actors and these commentators to suggest that populists are an existential threat or the biggest obstacle, as these last two uh, examples illustrate, um, presumes that in, the abs in their absence, or if we were able to overcome that obstacle, that uh, decisive and effective climate action would otherwise uh, be pursued or be taking place. And I think that's really the less their critique of the, the, the populace uh, than their presumption that the populace actually are that big of an obstacle is what I wanna highlight here. Um, one more example, this comes from a, a, a very recent blog post uh, in the, the blog of the ECPR, the, the, as many of you know, the international or the, the European Political uh, Science Association. Um, and here in this piece uh, called Curb Your Climate Enthusiasm, here come the populists. Uh, the author says, as the climate crisis begins to wreak tangible damage on human lives, mainstream political actors have become even more crucial. They must not only compensate for decades of inaction, they must confront the growing populist opposition. Again, I think uh, the, the, the point about the the uh, value and the ability of mainstream political actors to act on climate change is here made very explicit. Okay, maybe it's already uh, suggested in what I've said to this point, um, but all this is part of the reason that I wanna argue that anti-populism is a trap for climate politics. It's a trap because it presumes the adequacy of elite policy intentions. It presumes that those mainstream actors would be acting to address climate in a decisive way in the absence of the populist backlash. It reinforces the notion that the problem ultimately is the people, right? Uh, however that's defined. Um, that science offers a clear guide for action, that science can tell us what to do in effect, that policies that, uh, and, and uh, reinforces policies that I want to argue fail to address injustice. Um, so uh, again, uh, just a little bit of a sense of why I think this is a trap. Um, Anti-populism views populism as inherently exclusionary, as skeptical of knowledge of climate change, and as an existential threat to climate action. So all this, uh, I think, is, like I say, uh, a limited frame and ultimately an ineffective frame. In other words, what I really want to suggest uh, is that we engage in something like a thought experiment here. Uh, if the primary obstacle that anti-populists identify of authoritarian populism were somehow magically removed from the scene, 
would the mainstream political actors espousing this anti-populist framework be able to um, or be willing to effectively address the nature of our current climate catastrophe? I want to argue that the answer is no, um, or at least is in doubt. Okay, so let's turn to the, the, the third theme here, pitting the people in moral battle against elites. And again, I, I draw this, this particular definition of populism from Mansbridge and Macedo that I, I uh, noted at the outset. Um, are there other ways of thinking about who the people are in battle against elites, and therefore also other ways of thinking about the elites? And I think that there are. Um, many populist scholars, um, for example, Nadia Urbanati, um, focus exclusively on parties and leaders uh, who are, uh, as she says, striving to become a ruling power um, and dismisses social movements um, as populist because she says they're not so unusual and therefore not terribly interesting to scholars of populism. I think that's not uh, a, a reasonable way of, of uh, setting aside the role of populism in social movements and want to argue or at least suggest here uh, that some of the most powerful and distinctive aspects of populism are visible when we take a look at movements uh, like this, right? Um, like climate justice movements. And, uh, you know, I've given you just a sample here. This is it might look on this single slide like I'm illustrating a particular protest or movement, but it's not. These, these images um, and these references are taken from over a decade of uh, climate justice activism. Um, and you note, of course, the consistent message of people's demands, people's summit, people's climate movement, people not polluters, which side are you on? Um, and in particular, a definition of the people as those most affected, uh, most uh, direly affected uh, by climate change itself, uh, or at least those are the ones uh, at the forefront, uh, sometimes in, in the uh, climate literature and in the justice literature referred to as uh, frontline or fence line communities, those most immediately impacted, whether they're on small island nations, uh, or in marginalized communities in uh, countries in the global north uh, or in areas of the global south that contributed little uh, but are affected greatly uh, by the, the, the current climate crisis. Um, okay, uh, so what else might it mean then for thinking about pitting the people in moral battle against elites? That is, what is it that, that these justice movements uh, contribute here that might be seen as focused on a populist framework? Well, uh, one thing I think is uh, a focus on the everyday effects of climate on uh, that group uh, in society that is often diverse, but is def defined in these movements as the people, right? A focus on uh, the ability of people to pursue their livelihoods, a focus on practices of care and also on connections with place, the land and water and, and places in which people live and their need to sustain those places. Um, whether we're talking about a rural community or focus on place, um, even in urbanized and highly industrialized spaces uh, where the focus is more on uh, the, the, the harms that come from disproportionate impacts of uh, pollution, and other negative uh, 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 impacts. Um, we often think of climate as a global issue that affects everybody equally or more to the point affects, um, you know, the, the, that uh, distribution of, of effects is uh, somehow random, but it's really not, right? The effects of climate change, but also the effects of co-pollutants and other impacts uh, that, that contribute to climate change are deeply disproportionate um, and deeply unequal, something that the climate justice movement has highlighted consistently over the past decade. Um, what else? Um, pitting the people in moral battle against elites uh, as climate justice movements in all their diversity uh, do, 
um, is focused on uh, a knowledge of climate change that's often, as I noted in the previous slide, rooted in local knowledges that motivate action, um, being in a frontline community, seeing firsthand the effects of wildfire, of flooding, of uh, disaster of various kinds, um, of heat waves and so forth. Um, these kinds of knowledges uh, can be rooted in counter expertise. They don't necessarily require classroom instruction in uh, climate science. Uh, but they are relevant to thinking about this issue. Uh, and finally, um, this kind of frame, uh, in fact, does politicize the processes and responses to climate change uh, that, as von Rensburg talked about, are often also characterized as part of a climate skeptical argument. So here, um, we see a consistent rejection of what's characterized as politics as usual, an argument that that politics as usual, even in the absence of right-wing opposition from, from authoritarian populists, um, is not willing or able uh, to act effectively in particular ways uh, that benefit um, those most harmed and those most vulnerable to climate impacts. We are, the argument is made here, not all in this together, or at least not all in this in the same way together. Um, so uh, I want to return then for a few more examples and also to think about um, the, 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 the Guia Jean, the, the Yellow Vest movement in France back in 2018, because it's an example that, as the original news article that I shared with you a few minutes ago suggests, um, has especially in Europe uh, been a sort of touch point in discussion about uh, populism and climate change. The argument has often been made that, uh, you know, it's movements like this in reaction that were done in reaction to a particular policy that the Macron administration, uh, the Macron uh, government pursued in France, um, that this is the sort of uh, populist backlash that European leaders in particular worry so much about. Um, and the, the, the sort of uh, the talking point and, and slogan that the, the movement used in 2018, you see here both uh, in French and in the English translation, the elites talk about the end of the world, obviously a reference here to uh, Macron and others talking about climate change. Uh, when we talk about the end of the month, and of course, this is a reference to uh, when paychecks come in, um, uh, talking about the more immediate material needs to put food on the table, to pay the rent, to, um, you know, uh, take care of uh, family and immediate community needs uh, in that way. So there's a clear contrast suggested here um, that climate policy or climate politics, at least as it was pursued there in that particular moment, uh, uh, divided um, the concern of climate change from our everyday preoccupations with caring for self and family and community. Um, so that would suggest, and I think the, 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 the argument is often suggested, um, that there is this tension between the everyday interests of communities uh, and uh, the uh, ability to act decisively on climate change. But even in the Yellow Vest movement, uh, I think it's fairly clear that there was at the very least another thread of arguments that was very powerful, um, maybe even dominant. I'm not a scholar of French politics, so I don't wanna comment on that. And I've heard different perspectives on this, um, but the argument that um, is captured, I think in this, these next slides or these next images, that the end of the world and the end of the month, um, that is that our everyday concerns with our paychecks and so forth and the uh, challenge of uh, climate change um, are the same struggle with the same perpetrators. And you see these, these messages uh, conveyed in, in, in these images all, uh, as well. That I think suggests a different way of thinking about populism and climate change that I think can be very generative. Um, turn to another uh, brief example of uh, the North American anti-pipeline protests of the 2010s. And, and here I've, I've, I've just offered a couple images um, from well-known uh, high-profile uh, protests. 
This first one on the left is uh, from the Dakota Access Pipeline protests that distinctively, I think, were not just involved, but were really led by uh, Native American, indigenous communities and activists there um, who define themselves as water protectors, protecting their land and way of life. Um, but you see here, right, the argument is keep it in the ground, um, right? Uh, and, and no dapple, dapple is the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, water is life is one of the, the most consistent themes of that set of protests. And Roughly contemporaneously, starting a little bit before, uh, was protesting against the, the Keystone XL, another major uh, fossil fuel pipeline uh, running from the tar sands in uh, Alberta, Canada, down through the United States. Um, and uh, this, this protest uh, was also uh, a sort of a broad coalition of people going through the heartland of the, the, the United States in the Midwest. Um, you see here again, the language of the people, the language of we are greater than the tar sands. Uh, and uh, these sorts of anti-pipeline protests were quite powerful uh, in the past decade, um, still are, uh, but I think they really emerged to prominence in the 2010s. Uh, and one of the things that's really distinctive here, and I, I, I offer a, a quotation about it, is that uh, climate justice groups, but also mainstream political actors at first were quite, or excuse me, mainstream political actors at first were quite dismissive of these protests, basically saying, well, if that pipeline isn't built, it's not going to fundamentally change the calculus around global climate change. Um, but increasingly those actors and also the climate justice movements and groups that were pursuing this came to a realization that not only were these ways of protecting particular places and particular spaces uh, that were uh, subject to pipelines being built and go through them, but that um, as uh, Russell et al. described here, they seemed more capable of keeping carbon in the ground than lobbying efforts in Washington. And I think the timing of this is relevant to think about, right? These movements emerged at precisely the moment that um, on the one hand, there was initial hope and then immense disappointment uh, that uh, both in the United States that uh, a major climate change bill uh, promoted by uh, Obama when he was president uh, failed to pass, um, focused on cap and trade systems and so forth. And at the same time, roughly 2009, 2010, uh, the, the Conference of Parties of the UNFCCC in uh, Copenhagen uh, basically collapsed in recrimination and in action. Um, and this led, I think, in many ways to a deep sense of malaise in the climate, in the sort of mainstream climate uh, policy community uh, that uh, these sort of expectations that if, if in the United States there was a democratic president and a democratic Congress, that on an international level we could probably, we could finally get something meaningfully done about climate change. Um, and both of those efforts failed roughly at a time that these anti-pipeline protests were growing increasingly effective. So I think there's here a clear contrast from on the one hand, a sort of universalizing and global carbon pricing policy um, with a particularizing focus on place um, and on protecting particular places from uh, carbon impacts or from pipeline impacts. But the bottom line was um, that it was the particularity of these movements that made them effective and made them effective at addressing global climate change in an environment when the more universalizing policies uh, were uh, subject to failure, despite seemingly having uh, all the right political uh, opportunities lined up for them. So all this is, is as I say, and this is my final uh, theme here, um, all this is a way of thinking with the climate justice movements, and I want to emphasize their plurality. I'm not talking about one particular movement here, um, but climate justice movements, all of them uh, can be seen, I think, productively and generatively through a populist frame. Uh, who are the actors? Well, as I just noted, they're diverse climate justice movements. 
Uh, some uh, think of uh, movements like Friday for the future, Fridays for the future, for future first. Um, but I think increasingly it's uh, movements emerging from the global south, from marginalized communities uh, that have uh, increasingly been, but, but really have been all along uh, some of the most prominent leaders in the climate justice space. Um, there are some uh, left pop uh, there are some left populist parties and leaders that have also uh, identified um, in this kind of frame. Uh, there's a recent article in political studies by a couple of colleagues I know, uh, Laura Chazelle and Vincent Dane about uh, 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 France and uh, Mélenchon's uh, La France Insoumise movement as an example of a left populist leader that has made climate policy really central. Um, but I think it's really in the movements that this is uh, most visible. Um, so there is in these climate justice places and spaces an inclusive definition of the people, right? It's not the people, uh, you know, uh, understood in some unified notion of a general will, um, but as a diverse manifestation of those kept out of power um, or those who are most impacted by the global climate crisis. Um, there is a consistent rejection in these uh, movements of elite foot dragging at the, the cops and at the, um, the, the conference of parties um, and at the national policy level, um, and an argument that the primary uh, policy proposals that are being put forward in those kinds of spaces are false solutions, right? Um, whether we're talking about net zero policies uh, or carbon pricing policies, cap and trade and so forth, um, that these are not meaningful solutions to the climate crisis. Um, there is here, I think, also a distinction of expertise and knowledge from elites. Not all uh, forms of expertise and knowledge are elite. Um, and I think that also fit, fits into this uh, populist framework for thinking about these issues. Um, and a commitment to engaging people where they're at now, um, right, with the concerns, the experiences, the knowledge that they have, but then also building cooperative structures that can enable, can enable people where they're at now to make a difference on issues that transcend their local circumstances. I haven't said that much about these last couple points, but I'm happy to talk further about it in my questions or in the, the questions and discussion that follow. Um, but for now, um, I'll just say thank you um, and open it up uh, to any questions or suggestions. And I also am more than happy if any of you wish to follow up uh, via email, if I've made any references here that you wanna follow up on, um, please feel free to do so. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much for this really, really interesting presentation. Um, I can imagine that the students who are part of it, who, who had the opportunity to listen to you, have a ton of questions. 